So we've talked about the background of the Dark Hour, and we've uh, talked about the miniatures. Um, we want to get onto the thing which is dear to my heart, um, which is now we're going to talk about a little bit about the rules and how they play. And you're the architect of the, uh, the Dark Elder Codex film. Um, what can we expect um, from the Dark Elder army on the tabletop? Okay, well, uh, it's Death. fast. <laughs> and it's like a ton of bricks. That's basically the... Uh, well, that's the, the, the two, and then and it's, way very, it's it. very fragile. So um, the Dark Elder have always been extremely lightly armoured. Mm-hmm. Uh, their defence is speed, really, not rug- ruggedness or toughness. So as an overall army dynamic, um, it's characterised by the fact that it is the fastest of all armies. Sure. Uh, it is. It really hits hard. I mean, these guys have got... They're not massively strong or tough um, compared to, for example, a Space Marine or a, t- a Carnifex or whatever. But, as we said before, they cheat. They use all kinds of horrible war gear that will poison you or cripple you or flay you alive or steal your soul to get around the fact that they're you know, they're not these monstrous sort of steroid-infused people. So Although they have them. They do have those <laughs> too, yeah. Like I say, um, their technology is that high that they basically they have made loads of cool gadgets and shortcuts to get around all this stuff. So, um, individual, so that's how the main army works, actually. Uh, we wanted to also get across that feeling that um, the Dark Eldar feed on pain and they thrive on the anguish of others. So, whereas a normal army starts off as a, a grand force but gradually gets smaller and smaller and and less powerful as the game goes on. The Dark Eldar, they can work the other way around. They can can actually become more powerful as the game goes on. Because as your units, if your Dark Eldar unit kills an enemy unit, it will actually be able to feed on that death and and become more powerful. They get a token called a pain token. That will give them a a new special rule. So they can have up to three of these. Um, They actually can have more, but they get three special rules on top of that. So feel no pain, basically, as soon as they're infused with all this energy, then they can laugh off bullet wounds or sword cuts, and they're like, ah, you know, because they're so infused with this energy, then furious charge and finally fearless, which can be a double-edged sword, actually. So they become, essentially, your, your, um, your units start off as normal warriors, but halfway through the battle, they might be depleted, but the guys you've got left are these like, ravening killing machines that are just completely pumped up on all the energies of, of the battle. So that's the kind of the overall aesthetic of it, I would say. Cool. Um, through playtesting, uh, as you as you put them through the paces in games, I wandered past on many occasions <laughs> doing battle with Space Marines or Tau or whatever. What what lessons did you learn? How did your, you could, your you could hear you could them? hearing cackling from your room <laughs> in the studio. Cackle, um, Dale, cackle. If they are. Uh, quite a finesse army in that you have to use them intelligently. If you, you can't just wander out into the open and hope for the best, which you could get away with Necrons or Space Marines, Chaos Space Marines. These guys are not really forgiving if you make mistakes. If you leave your Witch's unit stranded in the middle of the battlefield, well, they're going to get shot to pieces by bolt of fire. Um, and then their mates will have to carry the bits home in a, in a bag. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. No, it depends on whether they uh, liked them. <laughs> we, uh, we tried to take a different... Although they all work in this sort of the same kind of way, in that they're very hard hitting and fast, and their initiative and weapon skill is massive, um, we tried to give each unit a different flavour and a each different role on the table. Um, Jez and I sat down at the beginning of the project and talked through. I actually made these uh, this sort of little index card type things, which are um, basically all we know about the warriors and the witches really and cool so forth. Look, look. And, uh, We've got a little These, pretty drawing as well. Yeah, and I've got Jez's early concept work on there. And there's, there's sort of basically the themes of each troop type. And then I use that to sort of inform what, what rules would go with that unit. And also to write up the, en- the uh, little entries for each of the troop types. So it was quite good fun doing it that way, actually, because we got to have lots of conversations about it. Um, and so that led to the special characters as well. So is there lots of interplay between the different units? Do they sort of pick up each other's strengths and weaknesses? Absolutely, yeah. The, um, the warriors and the racks, who are kind of like the homunculized minions, there, I see them being more as the, um, the sort of the sensible ones, if you will, that sort of guard objectives and do long-range firefights, and, and essentially they're, the, they're like the mainstay. Mm-hmm. The witches are your fast, super-fast combat machines who you want to get into combat as quickly as possible because right. they're bit rubbish if they're not in combat because they've only got six other armor saved. When they are in combat, my lord, they are impressive. Um, same with the Incubi, actually. That although they've got a really great 3-plus saving throw, um, their natural home is in combat because they've got amazing amounts of power weapon attacks and they will cut through pretty much everything 
that your opponent can throw at them. Small in number, I mean, these are quite expensive points-wise. So you're, uh, although you can max out and have a huge army of warriors and witches, which are relatively cheap, if you want to start taking all the fun, crazy stuff, the points soon disappear. Um, that's my, my main thing with Dark Eldar, is when I'm making an army, I just want to include all of the units, and I can't have to choose which ones to get rid of, and that is difficult. Yeah, but that's better than sort of like they're having no-brainer things. Yeah, there. I mean, right, that, that seems right. to me to be part of your deal anyway. Absolutely, like you want to make everything. it a difficult choice yeah. for the for the. Yeah, you know, and player. there's only a bit of it. I mean, this is just sort of like a portion of what we've got on, yeah. on the table. You know, there's only a few here. A few just of the selection. You know. But, um, within those units, there's also ways to customize them using them in different ways. So if you buy a box set of uh, Cabalite Warriors, you can just fill them as a unit of ten with one special weapon, one heavy weapon. You can put two boxes together to make a big unit of 20 with two special weapons and two heavy weapons. You can use them as Cabalite Trueborn, who are like the, um, the almost like the noble regal warriors. They're, sure. they're actually born by proper Dark Eldar parents as opposed to it by cheating. Tubes and, uh, yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the guys that have even more special weapons and heavy weapons and more attacks. They're like your veterans. So there's, there's different ways to use your models and, and move them around. And we've, we've uh, taken pains to ensure that existing Dark Eldar players can still use their models in the to come on to, that's cool. Well, well it's, it, we've, we've like, like Jess says, we have completely reinvigorated and renovated the range, but we've tried to um, keep the, the core stuff sacrosanct to the core idea of who the Dark Eldar are, what, how their weapons work, what, what's their playing style. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I, did, I mean, it's, it's that thing about not wanting to force people to change their models. I mean, ho hopefully you seduce them into it do it by just making really, really nice models. That's what my job is. If I make really, really nice models, then, we'll, then people will hopefully they'll want them, you know. But, you know, you could mix these in with your older ones if you wanted to. Absolutely. Yeah. Have some yeah. veteran. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, quite, you're, you know. We'd, I, and although we've changed, I, I think, I don't think we've sort of got rid of any main units. No, no, we've added to the, we've added to the units. We haven't really got yeah, there's a few few new ones in there, and a lot of them have been very heavily re, re envisaged. But as I said earlier in, in in the interview, that we were talking about the idea that when we were looked through it, if we looked beyond the fact that there wasn't an awful lot of background there, you know, we've had to come up with about twenty years worth of background, haven't we? <laughs> well, actually, ten thousand years yeah. ago. Um, <laughs> There was there was a core of something in each one of those troop types that we knew that we could do something with it, and it took a couple it took a wee while before I'd got something in my head visually for them. Um, but as soon as we we did that and we started doing the cards, I think I think each one of them started to suggest their own things, didn't they? Yeah, really? we, we so went through right. them one by one and said, right, okay, yeah. have we got something really cool for the scourges or the reaver jet bikes? What is the thing about the reaver yeah. jet bikes? They make flyby attacks. They're they're these crazy Formula One racing. Uh, they're incredibly obsessed about speed and about tinkering with their bikes to get a millisecond faster than their rivals. And they use the, the, the blade veins on the sides of their jet bikes to slash the enemy as they go past. That's yeah, so they use the they, they use the bikes as the weapon. Absolutely. And that was a nice little thing that we came to, came to with that one. That was just for instance, like, well, what guns are we going to give them? And we thought, well, there's a certain amount that we do need to give them for the long range stuff. But when Phil and I were talking about it, it was like, wouldn't it be really cool if it was actually the bike that was the weapon? So that if you imagine these guys in the, uh, the arena, right, they, they get different points for how you kill someone. Obviously, if you can flip the bike upside down and take him out with a top fin, then you get way more kudos than the one underneath. Yeah, so there's a lot right. of things like that in it. We did the same thing with the, um, the Hellions and the Incubi. We, we knew they both had, like, two-handed weapons on those ones. Mm -hmm. But they both look very similar. So, you know, talking between the two of us, we're like, right, we're going to do the double-ended hell glaives on these guys, and then the incubi we're going to change. We're going to do something completely different with that. But that's all in terms of, like, having the visual image, but also talking about what we wanted it to do on the battlefield, what film needed to, to do for the, for, the, um, for the way the list works. Because I can sit there, I can come up with 15 different guns, and I'm well known for putting way too many guns on models that are needed on there, especially vehicles. 
But you need to talk between the two of you about what's going to be needed on the, on the battlefield. So effectively, yeah, the, as you were working, the rules were informing your miniatures. Yeah, and vice, and vice versa. 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 It's the, sort of the there was loads of times when Jess was like, we need some more pistol tags. <laughs> so come up with ten more pistols. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, well, the other way the electric, around. The electric death pistol. Or the, or, the, or the other way around. Yeah, 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 yeah. the other way around. Oh, I've stuck these in, Jess. Oh, I haven't drawn that yet. I better draw that. What does that look like? Well, I don't know. Like You're the, the artist. Concept sketches for them, which were invariably right on the money, but some of which are actually in the um, in the codex itself. Um, so yeah, it was, it was an organic process. Awesome. Mm. Something something I, I always get excited about whenever I get to peel through a, a new codex for the first time uh, is the special characters. Um, it's one of the first places I go. Oh, who are the special characters in this? Because I think they tell you something about the army. Who have we got in the Dark Order codex? What can you tell me? Uh, okay, this could take some time. All oh, right, well, give us some whistle stop. <laughs> well, all right, uh, the do the old ones first because I mean we've we've kept some from the yeah. previous one, right? Okay, um, we, we kept good old Astrobel Vect, of course. He is he is the kingpin, the the, the monarch, the the daddy of Kamara, basically. He's um, absolutely ahead of his rivals to to the nth degree, and uh, and we like the idea of doing something more interesting with him instead of just saying, "Oh, he's the best one." Mm -hmm. uh, we thought, wouldn't it be great if he begun life as quite a lowly, almost a slave caste, and he's gradually through guile and cunning and double dealing and backstabbing, not through like the no nobility of aristocracy or whatever. He's just done it through cunning, managed to get right to the top of the pyramid. And to be pretty effectively the creator of what Kamora is now. Absolutely. He, it's, he, his, yeah. it's his story. It's him having sort of uh, um, subjugated all the other sub-realms and all the other cities and all the other ports and things and pulling them all together into, into Kamora. So is he still in? Absolutely. Lalith Hesperax is Lalith still in. Nice new model by, by, by Juan. Um, she's kind of your uh, gladiatorial queen, the uh, the Olympian athlete who's she's so very good at fighting that she doesn't even need any power sword or poison blade or any kind of all that cheating. She just does it with a piece weapons. of metal. Turn yeah, to she's, knives. She's just that hard that she can just dance around the enemy and, and leave a trail of cutthroats behind her. And we kept Urian. We kept Urian, Urian Rakoff. Uh, we've it's done a the the master hamantrus. Well, yeah, we've, no, there's, there's, a, there's a few more homunculi models coming up that <laughs> might just unfreak him. Uh, again, what we did with the, uh, we wanted to keep him, but we wanted to make him more than just, oh, he's a homunculus and he's the hardest homunculus. So we, there's a load yeah. more bits to him as well. And we like the idea that he collects deaths. So he's died. He's died and come back so many times that so he actually right. sees death as almost like a pastime, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something during the weekend. Yeah. Just he, he's got contempt for death, and that that kind of exemplifies something about the Dark Eldar. Is it really not afraid of all that mortality stuff? But other than that, we've added in a load. We've added in a load more. We have uh, Baron Sathalex, who's uh, the Sort Lord, of Hel Hellion. Lord Hellion, the Hell Father of the Hellions, who is the they're sort of like gangs around the Middle Darks, and he's this elusive character that nobody can quite find. And he's like he's their boss. We've got a Drasar, Drasar, the, the, the um, Master of Blades, Incubi Master. Um, I mean, he's been around. For he's before. a bit of a mysterious figure. They all, we're, we're, they we're all say are. that about they, them, the same. <laughs> right? are, yeah. uh, we've got a pirate prince in there, Duke Sliskus. We've got a female archon in there, the Lady Malice. Um, how many have I missed any? Uh, Karadrak, the decapitator we kept from last time. Yeah, the like, Mandrake guy, the Mandrake but we've rejigged him. We've oh, rejigged yes. him quite heavily he's, as well. He's, he's a collector of skulls. There's uh, so much to talk about, and Jimmy's waving behind the camera <laughs> to tell us that we're out of time. Um, I thought you just wanted to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Phil and Jess, for stopping and just talking to us for this, I was going to say a little while, but it's been a, a funny long conversation all about the new world. I'm pulling your... <laughs> you are. <laughs> you are. Where are the biscuits we were promised? Yeah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Not so much of a cup of tea. Uh, no, no. Should we do oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Thanks, Adam. Adam. Stop filming. <laughs>